Hi, everyone. It is now noon on the East Coast, and so we're going to get going with today's webinar. Welcome, everyone, in this middle of summer webinar. Uh, I'm Brad Rathgaber, the head of school of One Schoolhouse, and I am joined today by two extraordinary leaders, Susanna Jones, the head of school at Holton Arms School, and Naade Cody, the academic dean at St. Paul Schools in Baltimore, Maryland. Hi, Susanna and Naade. Welcome. Hey, Brad. Hi, Brad. Thank you. We are thrilled to get your thoughts on the topic today of creating an intentional faculty culture. Just a couple of housekeeping notes as we get going. Um, some of you may have seen already on our blog a piece that I wrote on intentional approaches to onboarding and why they're more important than ever. I'll note that next week's webinar is on building a culture of collaboration as we continue a monthly theme here on faculty onboarding. If you haven't taken a look at some of the student courses that One Schoolhouse is offering for the 21-22 academic year, um, we know that enrollment is happening quite a lot these days. Uh, if you have any questions on any of our student courses for next year, please don't hesitate to reach out. Yesterday in our newsletter, we started to take the pulse of academic leaders on what resources you provide to new faculty before the start of the school year. And as we like to do on a weekly basis, give you a little bit of an insight into how folks are thinking about this topic in our early results of this poll. We note that a lot of faculty, uh, uh, in terms of um, resources we provide to new faculty before the start of the school year, schools already start to do some new faculty meetings before the school year actually begins, making sure that faculty have a handbook, that they have mentors in place, that they um, understand the scope and sequence uh, of the school before getting going on campus. So Nade and Susanna, I'm thrilled to have this conversation with you because I know that you have some really wonderful insights to share with folks. And I'm gonna start by posing a question that kind of zooms way out and then zooms in towards how we think about helping new faculty. But the first question, before we get into kind of new faculty and onboarding in specific, let's talk about how leaders assess and influence faculty culture on an ongoing basis. Susanna, do you want to start us off with that? Sure. So <clears throat> I think that there are lots in, of ways in which um, leaders can do that, but I think that it primarily comes down to both communication and modeling on the part of the leaders themselves. And so I think there are messages that one should be presenting consistently uh, and that you also ensure that your team of your administrators, hopefully your department chairs, deans, whatever the structure in, in your school is, that, that everybody sort of sings to the same tune and with the same lyrics is, is the idea. And I think that that really starts from the top and, and that uh, when, I speak to the faculty or to the school as a whole, or even to students that those themes sort of run through on a, on a consistent basis. And it, that it also comes through in, in writing that one does, which it, again, it all depends on the structure of the school, but I think that um, those, are, those are key ways in which one does it. And then as the leader, you need to live out those values and, the, and what you believe that, um, the goals of the school should be. And obviously all of that ultimately comes down to the school's mission, but it also is should be expressions of um, institutional priorities and institutional goals, um, et cetera, that just, and I think sometimes it can feel as though you just say this, this kind of thing over and over and over again, but I think that one has to do that for the, the sort of messages to get to get through. And so basically I think you should kind of almost take every opportunity that you have to do that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Nade? I would completely agree with all of that, Susan. Um, I think it's about the openness and transparency of communication in both formal and informal ways. So as a leader being sure to have your door and office open to those informal conversations as well as the more formalized ones. Um, I agree with you using the structure of your um, inbuilt hierarchy. For me, it's department chairs, um, other academic team members and leaders and making sure that everybody's on the same page in terms of the messaging. Um, being 
open and accessible to your faculty, your staff, your administration, and building that trust and that relationship. So a lot of the times I think that being able to cultivate that culture or that positive energy we all want in our schools comes down to really truly getting to know the people you work with and you work for mm. and they getting to know you too and not underestimating those moments of pure joy and fun. We learn so much about one another and how we can build trust um, when you create those spaces and those opportunities to work and build together that's beyond perhaps, um, say, a strategic mission or plan or something that you have to execute. If you can take care of the knowing understanding um, what makes people tick, what makes you tick. Um, before that, before you get to a moment of executing a plan, I think that that works so much better in the long run for all of us. So there, there's a lot to unpack there. And actually, not I want to focus on one thing you just said there, because I think that this is something that folks have found particularly difficult to do in this past school year, unlike any other, right? Like knowing how people tick, knowing what really drives them, knowing what really motivates them has been difficult, I think, for us in the last 18 months in a way that it wasn't prior. How are you thinking about that then going into what we hope will be a much more, quote unquote, normal school year? And I think you spoke to this in your recent blog post that especially for new faculty thinking about this current crop and um, the previous year's crop of new faculty is also being new. And our, all our faculties in a sense are a little bit new to ourselves, to one another following this pandemic year. So something as simple for us is breaking bread together, finding ways of breaking bread together, whether it's um, all together outside in a picnic, whether it was food trucks, whether it was just small groups of um, meet and greets and just the what's going on in your classroom or in your workspace or intentionally finding those spaces um, the faculty room or the coffee center, et cetera, to be able to pull people in. Those are some of the informal ways of doing that. But I think the more formal and structured ways as well, is building them into your meeting schedule, being deliberate, whoever you meet with, to take that five minutes of, or 10 minutes of course time, break time before or after, just to ask and check in, how are you doing? What are you excited about that's happening this week in mm -hmm. your particular world? What can I help you with? And building and establishing those relationships. They're not, you know, um, incredibly innovative necessarily or redesigning, reinventing the wheel, but really going back to those interpersonal connections, pausing to ask how people are doing and what they're doing and what you can help them with. Susanna, one of the things that you mentioned when you were speaking too is that you feel like sometimes you're saying something over and over and over again, or that same messaging over and over again, and that that messaging needs to be consistent at all levels of academic leadership. Sometimes I know um, it becomes easy uh, for a department chair or a division director to focus on the what needs to get done rather than the big picture why. Can you talk about for a second why it's important for academic leaders up and down the academic leadership of the school to continuously focus on that why and repeat that same message? Well, I think it's it's because there needs to be a sense of the of the whole, I guess is, is the best way to think about it. And we have developed eight school-wide goals and competencies that inform uh, really everything that we do, not, not every of the eight goals informs everything we do, but all of that comes under an umbrella that we call learn well, live well, lead well, which is a mouthful, so we call it LW3. But, but what that has done is helped with that, everybody singing the same to the same tune because every department is using those school-wide goals in, in their own work. And so there's a real, coherence to the whole uh, using a, a, a backwards design approach. And I think that it 
as we as we think about how we're educating students now, I think we all recognize that we're thinking much less about that content in a specific discipline, which is not to say that that isn't still important. Of course it's important, but it's very different from the way it was. And I think this has really helped us to, to think on a much more institutional basis with a focus on these goals and, and competencies. That's great. Before we get into the next question, which I'm gonna to start to talk about new faculty and onboarding, I just wanna remind folks that uh, if you have a question, please don't hesitate to raise your hands. We use, uh, or excuse me, please don't hesitate to use the Q&A button in order to ask any questions that you have. Use the Q&A button to put in any questions that you have. We don't use the chat for questions, instead we use the Q&A button. So Suzanne and Nade, I wanna focus now specifically towards new faculty members and talk about how you onboard new faculty in a way that helps them understand and embrace the culture of the school and how you make it so that it's a really positive, fun experience for them. And I'll let either one of you jump in first. Well, I think that uh, we have continually revised the way we do our new faculty orientation. And we've done that uh, in part on the basis of feedback from the new faculty. So we survey the, the new faculty at the end of uh, you know, that process so we get input from them. And what we've really learned from that is that this is, a, like most of our schools, a very busy place. And that I think the way we used to do it could feel very overwhelming uh, when when we talked about all the sort of nuts and bolts and all, all that they we felt they needed to know, but we gave them so much that they needed to know that they couldn't possibly remember all of it. So we've tried to move it to be more interactive, more focused on the big picture, which is certainly part of what you talked about in your, your blog post. So thinking about those, those institutional priorities learn well, live well, lead well, the school, the, you know, the school wide goals and competencies. And I think that's given us a focus. We've also tried to make it more interactive. So there's kind of scavenger hunts to how to find things on the website. Um, so we're not just telling you how to find things on the website um, and, and building in more time for them to um, be able to sort of implement what they're learning, like get their course pages up and then having a program that runs the whole year where we can continue to go into greater depth on things as they need to learn them and know them. So it's not a one and done. We sort of sort of set the framework, give them an opportunity to, to get to know each other. They have lots of touch points. There's, there's time for them to spend, for example, one-on-one -on -one with their division director. There's time for them to spend one-on-one -on -one with the HR director, just so there's that sense of building those connections all about those relationships that Nada Day was talking about, um, which I couldn't agree more, just really key. But I think it's important that you you set a tone, you give them background on the school, where what the school's history is, where the school's going, what the priorities are, give them some crucial right then and there information they need to know, give them time, and then keep going after that. Mm -hmm. And I think we have a very similar um, setup at St. Paul School for Girls, um, certainly as you described as well, Susanna. It's the important thing is to recognize it's not a one and done. Right. And that you have them for the entire year. So let me backtrack a little. I think for me, onboarding new faculty actually begins during the hiring process, the moment in which they say yes um, to us and setting again, a tone of welcome. So often we might send um, a brief email by the department, by individual administrators welcoming, welcoming them and then signaling throughout when they should expect to hear from us. Because I think that satiates the planners who want all the information straight away and those who also like to meander their way through information. So touch light touch points throughout. We've built a very robust mentoring program and hopefully we get it right or more correct as the years go by in that every new incoming faculty member is assigned um, a mentor. We try to find somebody outside of their department so that they have another connection as well. 
then um, as they arrive, we need faculty orientation. It's, I like to think of it as almost getting ready for um, a party and trying to accessorize your outfit once you've planned your new faculty orientation. Take a good look at yourself and then remove two or three items um, of accessories that you really, really don't need. The, is it the time that they are introduced to your entire development, entire HR, entire admin team? No, they're not going to remember to Susan, to Susanna's point um, whatsoever. It's the, they really truly need the why of your school and why teaching and connecting with your students matter. And so if you can hone in on that, as we try to hone in on that during our new faculty orientation, that interconnectedness between what they're teaching, but more importantly, who they're teaching. Mm -hmm. And then the rest comes throughout the year with um, frequent meetings as a group together, at least once every month. And then for me, I, as academic dean, I meet with every new faculty once a fortnight, so every two weeks just to how are things going. I popped into your um, class to observe and hear some feedback type of thing. And then connecting them and introducing them frequently um, throughout the year to new people, to one another, encouraging them to see themselves also as a cohort and as a helpmate um, as well. That's been really, really key over the years um, as we've built our new faculty program. So Nade, I want to follow up on a couple of things there. It sounds to me like one of the key roles that you see that you play uh, is as a connector. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit more about that? Why that's so important to think of yourself as the connector, the, the linchpin that helps make sure that this new faculty member really feels like they're connected to the different pieces and programs of the school. Um, and I love that you use the word connection because we all know as administrators, when a faculty member chooses to leave, sometimes one of the reasons they, they give is that lack of connection to place, connection to um, the department or the school or the students, et cetera. So with that in mind, um, just to a point that was made earlier, sort of designing backwards, I'm designing connections for my faculty. So the connections around um, who do they need to know and understand um, and con connect with, work with, to make their um, first year, first two years a success at SPSG. Mm. So is it another department member? Is that another teacher who really outside of their department who does something incredibly well, who has a great relationship with their students? or delivers lessons in an innovative, engaging, interesting way. Um, when you're new, I think so much of your time is spent just trying not to bungle up teaching and doing that job you've been asked to do, right? So you're laser focused on that. You don't have the time or the space to think about all of these different aspects or the different people that you, sh you need or you should meet. So part of my job is making sure that I'm doing that thinking for them to make those introductions and helping them um, basically figure out how to make those introductions or continue to build those introductions afterwards. That's great. Susanna, you were nodding your head there too. You, in terms of sort of building connections? Building connections, yeah. I think that um, that happens, I think, a lot quite naturally here. I think that um, we actually have been reassessing, we were just talking about this, our mentors and thinking that maybe we aren't gonna go outside the department because there's so much, it, it feels as though there's so much to um, becoming acclimated here that maybe having somebody really close, we had always had the, the your theory, Nade. And now we're thinking that maybe somebody closer, actually, it seems again, from the feedback we've gotten from faculty, uh, that, that maybe it's actually helpful to have somebody who's very close to what you're doing and really understands what you're doing. So that is one connection right there. And I think our, our academic departments or in lower school, the lower school is you know where they're teaching in a team on a grade level, 
there's there's a lot of natural connection that that happens and I think that what we hear from faculty is I think you're right that people leave for a, a lack of connectedness but it's really actually rare that we hear that from our faculty I think there are ways in which um, the culture however it does this really does connect people with one another there are very few classes that are taught you know, by oneself, you, um, I mean, there are a few departments where that's true, but for the most part, you're teaching with other people. So I think that that loneliness that can come from teaching doesn't exist all that much. And, and there's really an expectation here of collaboration that, you know, two people teaching the course, there may have some freedom about what they're doing within that course and not everybody's doing exactly the same thing, but there's a real expectation that they're working together. And so I think all of those pieces um, develop uh, develop relationships that are really very strong and there's a very strong feeling of faculty community. And I do know that coming back in person, everybody, there was a real sense when that happened this March, that that was a really positive thing. And people, you could fe feel people, even in the ways that they were more disconnected physically, that they were feeding off of that connection that they had with each other. And I think we're all really eagerly looking forward to hopefully a, a more normal year of those personal interactions next year. One of the things I love about this conversation already is that uh, you both have a little bit different approaches based on some of the feedback that you've received. And you're both super, super intentional about responding to that feedback and making sure that you're developing a program that's going to fit for your specific community needs. I mean, I think that that came through just in this conversation quickly about, um, you know, working as a connector and how that happens either naturally or we have to be really specific about that based off of the feedback. I'm guessing that there's also some real distance distinctions we've already started to explore. One of them in terms of the mentoring programs that you have. We have two questions that have come in from Aaron and Lori asking to say more about the mentoring program, particularly the structures, expectations, are mentors compensated in time and money in some way, or is that something that they do aside? Um, for us, hopefully moving to um, a model where mentors are compensated in some small way um, for the work because it does become a considerable amount of work a lot of joyful work but if it's done and it's done well um that takes time and effort and heart um the structure really begins again once a faculty member has been hired myself and the division heads sort of sit and think about who on our faculty might be a good match for somebody who's incoming and somebody who's identified, we've identified through the interview process or they have self-identified through some careful um, questioning and surveying what areas and strengths that they want to work on. So matching a mentor specifically with that. And therefore um, I have, I'm thinking about this year's new faculty, some for whom teaching is not new. Our school may be new to them. So they're not necessarily going to need that kind of mentor who reminds them how or what, what it is to be a teacher in your first five years out. And then I have one or two who are going to be completely brand new. So the mentors um, connected with them are completely different for that purpose. Additionally, um, I also meet with the mentors individually and as a group to figure out um, how things are going, what sort of conversations, what sort of questions are coming up. Um, if I discern a pattern to those, obviously those patterns go into some deliberate programming for all of the new faculty, as opposed to um, one-offs. We've also created um, something that's a little calendar-based. So anticipating the cycle of um, somebody who's new to us um, calendar year, we can um, have some pointed reminders some deliberate conversations and touch points when it comes to, for example, um, back to school night. If you know um, the independent school world, that doesn't surprise you. But if you're coming from elsewhere, that's something new that you have to be acculturated to and prepped and planned for. And then thinking through the year as well, the, as in sort of 
box and troughs a little bit and being ready and poised to meet our new faculty at each at each of these different points in the calendar year. Um, and so what happens there has been created and, um, and constructed not only by me, by my instructional coaches, um, the uh, learning specialists and division heads, but more importantly, by successive years of new faculty who've gone through this process as well. And then um, the second, and I'll stop talking in a moment, thing that I think is really, really key to emphasize and to understand of your own school culture. What are those formal cultures that we are all aware of? And what are those informal cultures that we kind of sort of know, but you can't anticipate um, that somebody coming new would necessarily know. So as you're planning new faculty programming, whether it's orientation or a year long um, program, you also have to plan for those formal as well as informal cultural elements and moments. Excellent. Yeah, that's a, that's a great point. Um, and I actually think ours is very similar uh, <clears throat> in, in most respects. Uh, our mentors, there is a, a very clear set of expectations for them. They, and part of that is that they meet monthly with their, their mentees. And uh, to Nade's point, uh, some of the, the sort of curriculum that's been developed for the full year's um, uh, sort of ongoing orientation, if you want to call it that, which is, as is true at St. Paul Schools for Girls here, is run by our academic dean, uh, Rachel Horline. And I... Uh, there are times when she will say specifically to mentors, can you spend a little bit of time talking to your, your mentee about back to school night is a perfect example, or um, it's you know the first set of report cards. So there's also some kind of curricular structure built in to the, the mentoring um, relationship as well that it complements what's happening in the full group of meetings that that um, Rachel has with the group. And then she also invites people into those full group meetings along the way. But I, th I think actually it's, it's very similar um, to the way um, St. Paul's um, School for Girls does it. And similarly too, in, in the selection process of, of mentors really thinking about what is gonna work best in terms of interests and sort of where people are in their professional trajectories, et cetera, who, who will be a good mentor. One thing I'm also hearing both of you say is that you have to make sure that who's ever in charge of the new faculty orientation really has the time to do that job well too. That it's a significant portion of the work that they're doing. It's not seen as an add-on. Nade, I was struck as a few minutes ago when you said that you meet with every new faculty member every two weeks. You know, Susanna, I was struck when you said that Rachel, your academic dean, really sees this as a huge portion of the work that she's doing. There's an intentionality around time um, that is super important as well, isn't there? Yes. Yes, completely. And the meetings don't have to be, you know, incredibly lengthy. One of the ways in which I use them is to have, um, as I said, a pop-in visit or an announced visit into their classes um, ahead of a meeting and that might be a 10 minute 20 minute 15 etc um, visit into a class a couple of days ahead of time and then when we meet at least we have something concrete that we can focus in on yeah. um, as well in a conversation about what's going on in the classroom but those uh, fortnightly meetings I sort of I say that they're for my new faculties so it's a mix of that's that type of feedback in terms of what I'm seeing in the classroom, um, an opportunity to answer questions they may have, to flag what's upcoming. Sometimes there's a little bit of a therapy session as well. It doesn't always have to be you know, focused on business. Take a walk with them. Mm -hmm. um, use it as an opportunity to, um, to see another class or to perhaps walk down to a game together. Yeah. And then in that walk, you're having your quote unquote meeting as well. But it is calendared um, for both of us regularly um, throughout, throughout the year. 
That's wonderful. Well, we have reached now 1230. I know there are a couple of questions that we have that are unanswered today. The good news, folks, is that we'll be concentrating on this topic all month long. And so make sure to join us for our webinar next week and see some additional thoughts that we'll be putting into blogs, et cetera, as the month goes along. Susanna and Nade, thank you again for your participation in today's webinar. I know folks caught a lot out of your thoughts. Thank you for the opportunity. Good luck, everybody. Thank you. Take care, everyone. Bye-bye.